Hello and a warm welcome to Talking Stocks. I'm Kukule Tukele. In studio with me, I'm joined by Sean Ashton and Brian Rudd, both from Anchor Capital. Now, today we're talking global automotive company Daimler, the 13th largest car manufacturer and second largest truck manufacturer in the world. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us today. I think whenever we think of Daimler, as we saw on screen that uh, emblem, we think Mercedes-Benz, right? Yeah, that's it. Um, yeah, they're pretty much the Merck brand um, and sitting in the Merck cars and everybody knows those from the little A class all the way up to the big S class. Mm -hmm. Maybe if we can walk through uh, just a little bit more of the uh, trucks element as well that's involved in the business. I understand that that also plays a significant role. Very much so. Um, trucks make up around about 18% of their operating profit um, and a fairly big division. And as we, we've pointed out, second biggest truck manufacturer in the world. Um, they have a few brands that sit within that, um, but quite an exciting prospect for them at the moment. Um, mm. They've seen some nice pickup on a global scale from the demand, um, as well as they've actually successfully tested the first fully electronic truck or electric truck. So going head to head with Tesla in the electric space as well. Sure. Uh, let's walk through some of those highlights once more. New product releases, and it does seem as though back in the day, uh, Mercedes-Benz as a brand was really marketed to uh, the more accomplished, esteemed, mature audience members, but they tried to uh, capture the young market as well. more youthful. And yeah. Google, I think this is a company that lost its way a number of years ago. Mm. They, did, they had a tie-up with Chrysler back in the late 90s. Um, the, the product quality wasn't what it should have been for, for a number of products that they brought out and had manufacturing outfits in the US. I mean, the one that comes to mind was the first ML Mercedes. Uh, no offences to anybody who's, who's got one of those, but I think that, that, that didn't do their brand any, any favours. But I think they've, they've increasingly, you know, post the, post the breakup with, with Chrysler, I think they've got their product cycle right. Um, the latest products that they're producing are top-notch. Um, and they're gaining a lot of market share. And I think the, certainly in the global space, in the luxury space, they're now number two behind BMW in, uh, uh, globally and, and uh, number one in the US. Um, but I think more importantly, you've now got uh, one competitor that seems to be limping along as a result of the VW scandal. Mm. So, so Audi was gaining a lot of market share in recent years. They've now slipped back. And I think that, uh, that that probably gives Merck the opportunity to continue to forge ahead with, with mm. share gains. Mm. Let's talk about that VW scandal just for a moment. Uh, we know that it has impacted on the industry, but uh, we take it that uh, companies like Daimler uh, have their books in order? Well, it's, uh, when the news broke, mm. um, literally everybody got impacted. So we did see a dip in pretty much every vehicle manufacturer around the world. Daimler has come out with a public disclosure stating all their vehicles and their trucks are accurate as per the testing and voluntarily opened it up to say right if you want to test and check so they really did take a front foot stance um, and went out there and said we've got nothing to hide um, so it really was a positive foot forward from management there. Mm -hmm. Maybe that also presented a buying opportunity if we look at the share price. Let's just run through the metrics as well quite a large company from a, a market cap perspective yep. 85 uh, billion euros. euros yes. yeah. Yeah. So it's a big business trading at a reasonably low rating. I mean, it's a trailing 11 PE. We're expecting quite a big bump in earnings this year. A lot of it is cost savings driven. So the, the third quarter numbers showed uh, operating profit up about 30% or so. So I mean, the Ford P multiple is about nine times. So quite a low rating. I don't think that auto manufacturers, generally speaking, are highly rated stocks because I think it's a, it is an industry that has tended to have been plagued with overcapacity and lack of pricing as, as issues. Um, but, but we think that, uh, I think the attractions of Daimler for me are a very attractive product cycle and hopefully they can sustain that for some time. Uh, so market share gains coupled with uh, quite a low valuation and a pretty attractive dividend yield. Mm. I mean, the, on a forward basis, we think the dividend yield should be north of 4%. Mm. On the metrics, on c in comparison with uh, some of their peers, uh, what do the likes of BMW and the others look like? Well, if we look at um, some of the, uh, well, let's work off BMW. BMW is their biggest global competitor. Um, BMW is slightly more expensive, uh, around about on a trailing 12 and a half and a forward 10 and a half, so marginally a little bit more expensive, slightly lower yield, um, and also a slightly more, uh, slightly lower return on equity. That being said, and as to it, we can't discount them. They're still a very big business as well, and they've gone through pretty much what Daimler had 10 years ago. Mm. Nice range of products but nothing that you look at and go, well, that's nice, I want one of those. So if BMW decides to go into a new product cycle, that potentially could be a threat to Daimler. Um, but for at this moment in time, Daimler is uh, my pick of the, the sector. Mm. 
And do we like the markets in which they see a, a lot of their revenue coming from, the likes of Germany, the USA, and Western Europe also quite strong? It's quite a global business. I mean, if you look at the sales mix, so I, I think it's quite difficult to, to cherry pick and say that they're exposed to a particularly great market. I think it's, it's a very global company. Mm. Well, that's neat, but the US steaming ahead, 25% um, of revenue comes out of the US. Um, Germany, as much as being part of the Europe, hasn't really had the impact that some of the other areas have. And, and then China is actually growing as a part of the business. Um, and if we look at the numbers on screen, 10% out of China, this was the last financial year end. The latest quarter that was up to 12%. So we are seeing demand coming out of, out of China. And specifically, it's a luxury brand without driving around in a Bentley or a Rolls Royce. So with the, the shift down in, in luxury spending in China, this has actually played very, very nicely into Daimler's hands as well. And, and VW, I think just to talk about China as a market, VW has historically had the foothold in, in China. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you've, if you've ever been to China, the, the, the luxury car of choice is a black long wheelbase Audi A4. You see millions of them <laughs> everywhere. So I think Mercedes-Benz is coming off, although it's 10% of their sales, I think they're coming off quite a low base. So the potential to grow in China is, is, is significant if mm. they can get around that, uh, uh, that historical market share issue with VW. And like you say, the timing is correct given the uh, change in uh, the uh, economic landscape in China where we're trying to drive more consumer spending. Yeah. But having said that, uh, we mentioned that uh, one of the biggest trends that uh, many people have identified is a new car sharing model, the likes of Uber as well as car sharing services. Could that not be a threat to vehicle manufacturing companies like these? I think it is, a th it is ultimately a threat because it means that if you've got more sharing, you've got uh, resources that can be spread out over, the same resources spread out over more people or less resources for the same people. So, mm. so ultimately... It is a threat to, to the volume outlook for the whole industry. I think as, a Brian, as Brian alluded to earlier when we were discussing, you know, at, at the luxury end of the scale, I would expect to see somewhat less of an impact there. But certainly for, for cars, for, for manufacturers that are more economy focused, I, I, would, I would expect to see more volume impact mm. at that end of the scale. Mm -hmm. Let's also come into operating income split uh, as well, just to get a view there. Naturally, as you say, the vehicles being the biggest contributor to income, but financial services, vans and buses and trucks also playing a significant role there. So a nice uh, uh, role of portfolios that they actually split into. Well, that's the thing, you know, the, the vehicles have taken a, a little bit more of the pie of late. Um, there has been fantastic growth in their vehicle sales, but they've also got this truck business that, as you say, just keeps on trucking. It's a, it's a great business. Um, very high demand for their product. Financial services is the bit that is kind of a bit of a surprise in this mix, is they have the ability to, to offer the services to their clients, both from a, a retail as well as a wholesale and a, an institutional perspective. And making up 13%, it's actually a fair contributor to the business and one that's not necessarily going to go away anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Does this give it the competitive edge then, these different uh, portfolios that it's in uh, against uh, the likes of Tesla, which pose competition and uh, some of the other threats in the market? Yeah, if we go and look at, I think they've got a nice healthy mix, the, that they've got the cars and they've got the trucks and the buses. Um, so when we go and look at, uh, say, a BMW, they've got similar kind of divisions, but not to the extent that um, Merck does. We look at a Tesla, Tesla's pretty much three models. Yes, there's great demand. At this stage, I don't think they're a big threat to to a lot of people because they can't produce the numbers. You know, when we're going, Merck sold half a million cars in the last quarter. It was a record number of vehicles that they sold across the entire range. Mm. I think Tesla can maybe do 20,000 vehicles a year. So I could be wrong on the number there, but it is, it, it's a lower number. So they've got the scale, they've got the product mix, they've got the pricing power. You're getting an S-Class for the same price as a, an S-Model Tesla, you know, and I can guarantee you I know which one I would choose. So. They've got a nice mix and I think they have the ability to compete with pretty much anybody in the market at the moment. Let's go back to the uh, uh, technical analysis of the company, historical PE, which you did allude to early on in the show, Sean, uh, together with the strong revenue as well as earnings per share mm. growth, uh, just how those compare with the historical performance. So I think this year is a big year from, mm. from a profit point of view, it'll grow quite sharply. Some of it is restructuring and cost savings driven. But ultimately, I think this is a business that should be able to sustain um, it's certainly not a double-digit EPS growth story. I mean, if you've got a 16% return on equity um, and, and you're paying out close to half of your earnings, yeah, and, and if, that, if that REE is sustainable, you would expect that earnings per share growth is going to be in the single digits. So I think that's the first point to make. Don't expect to see kind of runaway mid-team growth in hard currency for this company. Mm. Um, I think the valuation reflects that. So, so when you look at a, a single-digit PE, it's, uh, it's, it's reflective of its growth potential. 
Um, and for me, the attraction is to say, for, for, for yield-focused portfolios and, and clients, you're getting quite an attractive starting yield. Because the valuation is low, the payout ratio on earnings, I think, is about 40%. So you land up with about a 4% a, a odd forward dividend yield, which is quite high in a global context. You know, many global businesses the, that, we, that we look at in the, in the world today are giving you dividend yields less than 2%. Mm. So it's quite high. Mm. You know, it's, and if we look at from a, the price earnings model, you know, the chart we have is over a five-year period. And currently trading slightly higher than its long-term average, but returning to that long-term average at the, the December year in 2016, and then getting more attractive into 2017. So, yeah, it's very attractively priced, this business. Um, you're not, I don't think you're overpaying for what you're getting. Well, we'll leave it on that note before we get our analysis as to a buy, hold, or sell. What do the experts say? Brian, a buy, hold, or sell, Daimler? I'm going to go with a hold on this one. So if you have the stock in your portfolio, I would sit quite happily with it at the moment. Mm. It's, it's attractively priced. You're getting a good yield out of it, but you're not shooting the lights out. You're not a growth play. So, you know, when we look at yield and income stocks and all the rest of it, none of them are the growth of a Netflix or a, an Amazon or something like that. Mm. So you really are paying reasonable multiples for a reasonable yield. So if you're looking for an income, put it in your portfolio. But from as we hold it, we've held it for about the last two years, I'm quite happy to sit on the position and hold it riding forward. Sean, you agree? Yeah, I think it's a hold, Google. I would stop short of saying buy. I mean, our, 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 our kind of investment style in our business is, is not always to look for the cheaper stocks out there. Um, you know, we, we're happy to pay a premium for premium growth. I don't think this is one of those. So the, the valuation, yes, is attractive, but a 16% return in equity is indicative of a business where there's not massive moats around there. They don't have a huge economic moat around their business. There are competitors that can come in and take market share with, with, a, with a new product life cycle. Mm. I think they're in a good space right now, which portends well for the next year or two. Um, but the, the yield is attractive, um, but uh, I, I wouldn't say that it's going to necessarily turn this into a 15% total return stock. I still think it's possibly double digits because your earnings growth, your trend rate of earnings growth is going to be sub 10%. So for me, it's a, I would call it a solid hold. I think you protect it to an extent by, by valuation. Exactly. Well, we'll leave it on that, for no, that note for tonight. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us. Uh, a hold, that recommendation, as we hear it from our experts, Sean Ashton and Brian Rudd, both from Anchor Capital. That's their view on Daimler. Do join us again next time where we talk more stocks.